Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Mr. Sinister by Carol John Daly Part 1 Death Gives an Order If you have a little better food, a little better cooked, and for a little better price, more people will wear a path to your door than in any better mouse-trapped racket, despite the old adage. And that was the way of things at Mike the Greek's place. It was a small restaurant, down three steps on a dark side street. It was almost 7.30 and despite the lateness for the patrons of the Greeks did not observe the formal dining hour. The single room was more than comfortably filled. There was little to notice about the people who ate at Mike the Greeks. You could drag a net down most any New York City street and catch yourself a hundred or so just like them. Still, one little old lady had an eye for detail and a good memory. She spotted the man alone at the table for two and noted that he faced the back of the room rather than the street. She always faced the street herself when possible for she liked to watch the crowds filing in and out. This man was the only one who sat alone at a table for Mike's didn't bow to the niceties of seclusion while dining and why should he eat at 65 cents including two cups of coffee? So she wondered why the man was alone. Several people had approached the vacant chair at his table. One or two actually sat down, but both had arisen before they gave their orders. Old Mrs. Tremont was sure that the man at that table had not spoken. He had simply raised his head and looked at them. Long? Certainly. Steadily? She thought so, but she could not see the man's face. A waiter approached the table and said something to him in a low voice. The man got up and walked down the aisle toward the kitchen and lifted up the receiver of the payphone that was fastened on the wall. There was no booth, no box-like stand even, no privacy of any kind to this phone planted black and naked against the white wall, or fairly white wall. She could not hear the man's voice. She didn't even know if he said anything, for she was not in a position to see his lips move. But she did see him return to his table, and did see him sit down in the opposite chair, this time facing the entrance to the restaurant. She doubted, too, that anyone else would have noticed he had changed his seat. He did it so naturally. Then, with a single movement of both hands, he leaned across the table and dragged the pie plate, the coffee, the few utensils, and even the water glass and napkin toward him. Just a single gathering movement, and for a moment she even wondered if he hadn't been sitting in the same seat before. It was a few minutes after... That she saw his face. For a second, as it turned toward her, it startled her, for she couldn't exactly describe it. It hadn't stood out in detail. Simply one quick impression. Disgusting was not the word. Revolting wouldn't fit it either, and certainly ugly was out of the question. She knew it was sharp, and finally, being a stickler for the right word, she laid one on it. Sinister. That was it. Nothing else would fit that face. She nodded her head. She was pleased with herself. She watched him light a cigarette, place it between thin lips beneath a hooked... Well, she at least thought it was a sharp nose. She saw his left hand fooling with a spoon in the coffee cup, his right hand toying with his napkin. She was wondering if she knew any gentleman who permitted a cigarette to dangle in his mouth. Offhand, she could think of no one who smoked that way. Besides, Mrs. Tremont turned her head as a sinister man raised his head and looked toward the door. Then she stopped thinking. At least she was unable to put coherent thoughts together. But she did take in the entire picture. Three men had thrown open the restaurant door, and they strode determinedly into the room. One was in the lead, two others flanked him. They didn't wear masks, and they didn't wear caps. But the dark fedoras they wore hid their faces sufficiently. 
She could not see at first what the man in front carried in his hand as he walked quickly to within almost twenty feet of the sinister man at the table. Then she saw it. She had seen too many movies not to recognize its black, horrifying significance. She thought she shrieked out, Tommy gun! But she heard no words. Yet it was a machine gun, and it was pointing directly at the body of the sinister man. Then the man with the gun spoke. His words were loud and commanding and triumphant. Okay, feller, he said. You asked for it. Now you can take... Mrs. Tremont's eyes nearly popped out of her head. She had expected a fusillade of shots, but there had been only one single report. She didn't see any smoke or any flame come from that Tommy gun. She simply saw the cold, cruel, living eyes of its possessor turn to glassy, expressionless, dead ones. She heard the machine gun fall to the floor, saw the man who held it clutch at his left side as he sank slowly to his knees. Then he toppled forward on his face. Things happened quickly after that, almost too quickly for even Mrs. Tremont to follow. She knew that one of the men behind the dead machine gunner raised his hand and that there was a snub-nosed pistol in it. She knew that the third man ran toward the door. She knew, too, that the man with a gun suddenly cried out in terror and started toward the door after his companion. She heard the words plainly before the sinister man arose from his seat. No, he whimpered in terror. For God's sake! That was all he did say. The sinister man had shot him down and was stepping over the body and running into the streets. Before that door fully closed, she heard the single roar of a gun, the racing of a powerful motor, then pandemonium broke loose in the restaurant. She didn't know if the sinister man came back, but someone had stood in that doorway and forced the people back into the dining room. She didn't know what he said, for she had remained seated at her table. Her uncle George, when she was a very little girl, had told her always to do that, in a panic. After that, a uniformed policeman was there. The proprietor, Mike, was speaking, and even before other policemen came, the waiters had restored some semblance of order. She was proud of her city and her police force. In no time, the place seemed full of men in uniform and others who weren't. But she wasn't going to be fooled by the big, brusque man who kept his hat on when he questioned her. She didn't like his manner. It wasn't the roughness of it she disliked, but rather the indifference. He was ready, she thought, to pass her up as another frightened female. She got to her feet, pulling up her huge bulk haughtily, and crossed over to the table where the sinister man had sat. Yes, lady, said the detective from Homicide. Fifty people have told us the man sat there. We want only a simple statement of what happened. Simple, she shook her head. Well, what I have to say can be said only to the commissioner of police himself. I knew him when I was a little girl, which was not true, for when she was a little girl the commissioner had not yet been born, and besides she knew him only from his pictures in the paper, which last fact the detectives found out to his sorrow. The commissioner of police was a big man who sat far back in his chair and let his fingers drum together when he talked. He had not come up the hard way from the force. His life had been a busy one and successful. His appointment had been entirely a matter of ability, of having ideas of his own, on running a great police system, and of a long-standing friendship with the mayor, despite his lack of interest in politics. The boys in the know had looked at him as an experiment. They still did, for that matter. But they discovered that the experiment was to be theirs. Everyone knew the commissioner was too big a man, too wealthy, and too important to be shoved around. It was only later they found out that he was also too big a man to be soft-soaped, cajoled or misled into any action of political expedience. Now the commissioner was not sitting in that chair. He was walking up and down the room. Occasionally he looked out the window at the scurrying little people far below. He felt a great responsibility to those people. He turned again and regarded the man who sat so quietly in the chair by his desk. That man had the body of a god and the face of a devil. His whole head was shaped almost like the letter V. Even his green eyes planted and his ears tapered, and there was again the peculiar V-shaped growth of his jet-black hair. The commissioner didn't know when the name was first attached to this detective, who was the terror of criminals, big and little, throughout the city. Officials didn't like him. Newspaper editorials had appeared against him, and the first time the commissioner had seen him was when he talked to him before he dismissed him from the force. That was some time back, and Detective, um, the Commissioner couldn't remember its real first name now. Well, Detective Satan Hall had been with him ever since. 
working direct for him. Well, the commissioner spoke after a while. Haven't you got anything to say? Satan's wide shoulders moved slightly. It was messy, I suppose, he said without apparent feeling. They dragged the third man into the car. We'll soon be finding out who he was. His friends in the car may take care of him. They wouldn't have much use for a dead body. You know he's dead? I shot to kill. You're not going to threaten to fire me again, are you? It wouldn't do you any harm, the commissioner smiled. Chicago called me up today. They'd like to offer you a good job out their way. The man you killed was the first one, Lawson King, a real killer and a dead shot. Maybe, thin red lips parted and white teeth showed, but he talked too much. He talked himself to death. And now what's the beef? There is no beef, said the commissioner. All three were notorious Chicago hoodlums. It's your flair for the dramatic, Satan. A respectable residential street. A crowded restaurant. I didn't pick the time nor the place. Didn't you? The commissioner leaned forward. Don't tell me you didn't know it was coming. Never had any idea before I dropped in to eat, Satan answered innocently. The commissioner said with meaning. There was a machine gun covering you, and you drew and fired. Is that it? He wanted to talk, said Satan. Where's the napkin? And when Satan looked at him blankly, the napkin you jammed into your pocket when you went after man number two. And when Satan still stared, the napkin you held your gun under and shot through. Oh, that, said Satan. I'm keeping it as a souvenir. It's not a bad idea. Are you in the habit of eating dinner with a gun clutched in your right hand, and that right hand, and what it contains hidden by a napkin? I want the truth, Satan. There was a Mrs. Tremont in that restaurant with a nose for crime and an eye for detail. She was watching you. She watched you go to the telephone, watch you return and reverse your position so you sat facing the door. No, she didn't see you slip your gun under the napkin, but she saw you slip that napkin in your pocket when you ran from the place. She knows me? No, said the commissioner. Then with a grin, she described you as a sinister man. Don't scowl. It's not a bad description. So you see, you could have avoided the dramatic. Someone telephoned you that the death trap was set for you. You could have left, couldn't you? Yes, said Satan. Why didn't you? Because, said Satan, no criminal, no hoodlum, no slimy murderer is going to drive me from my dinner. As simple as that, huh? The commissioner said, but there was no irony in his voice. He hadn't expected such an answer, yet it didn't surprise him, coming from Satan. What's more, he knew it was true. Another look out the window, and the commissioner said, Of course I am not going to ask you who telephoned you. Do you know? Satan hesitated a long moment. Then he said, I think I know. Was it a woman? Satan only grinned, and the commissioner tried again. Lawson King must have had a reason for coming on from Chicago. You didn't know him before? And when Satan shook his head, the commissioner went on. It would take a big man to bring him on, big money, too, for a man to attempt your life. I know how many would want to see you dead. But do you suspect anyone of hiring Lawson King? Yes, Satan's lips snapped closed. Who? You won't like it. You have told me enough things I don't like, Satan. But when they were true, I took them and liked it. It was Tony Paro, Satan said, and after a pause, do you want to know why? I can tell you what you'll tell me, the commissioner said. Paro runs the biggest gambling establishment in the city of New York, above his nightclub. Paro has protection. You are not in tune with my views that, for the present, at least we should tolerate certain things that are crimes on our statute books. I don't believe, Satan, that you can legislate morals. I know we should enforce the laws, but I would rather keep an eye on our vices than drive those vices up back alleys. Yes, Satan nodded. Power runs his nightclub downstairs as a blind for his gambling upstairs. But what you won't believe is that Power runs his gambling rooms to hide other crimes. You mean what I haven't proof of, Satan? And suddenly swinging around and staring long at him, he said, Go after the man. Bring me that proof. For the first time, Satan showed emotion, at least physical movement. He said, The politicians won't like it. And when the commissioner still stared at him, he added, you have guessed the truth, perhaps. Paro is big. He is getting bigger. 
I doubt if there's a thousand dollars worth of marijuana sold in the city today from which Paro does not get a rake off. Opium is coming in again. He'll control that. I don't believe there is even a small-time crook in the entire city who gets murdered that within twenty-four hours Paro doesn't know who killed them and why. Satan shrugged his shoulders. He will, if not stopped, rise to a great power, a powerful evil in the nation. He must have a great deal of money. No, said Satan, he hasn't. As a matter of fact, he's in debt. Not that he doesn't make plenty, tax-free money. He counts his small change in thousand-dollar bills, I imagine. But he's an opportunist. His ride to success must be quick, spectacular, and sensational. He's throwing back every cent he can get his hands on into his business, the business of power. He doesn't consort with criminals? Not publicly, but remember, Commissioner, that a president of a great bank can be as much a thief as the ragged burglar who climbs the fire escape of a tenement house, and a dishonest stockbroker takes more money from widows and orphans in one day than the subway purse snatcher takes in his entire lifetime. Paro is beginning to get into exclusive clubs, partly through his influence in politics, partly through the social contacts he has made, partly because he'll take a second mortgage on a socialite's property. It won't be long before he's accepted by the best people. It won't be long before he has a grip on the party in power, or puts in his own party. He has killed or has killed, well, over a hundred men. You exaggerate there, Satan. No, I don't exaggerate. I underestimate of anything. For the last time, and that's not a threat, Commissioner, I'm telling you because it won't be much longer before Paro is too big to handle. You could handle him now? Satan's lips clicked in pleased determination. I might goad him into drawing a gun on me. No, said the commissioner very seriously. He wouldn't draw a gun on you. It couldn't be that easy. You'd like to see him dead? Yes, the commissioner said, I'd like to see him dead. You'd like to see me kill him? Satan leaned forward now. No, the commissioner shook his head. If I believed in murder, Satan, I wouldn't ask another man to do the killing for me. But I do believe in justice. I want that proof against Paro. I'm out to get him now. You have sent that word down the line? There was disbelief in Satan's voice. No, I haven't. And then he said suddenly, I haven't been a good commissioner, Satan. I'm afraid it's personal with me now, this Paro business. He's been seeing a lot of Elsa Drake. I spoke to her about it. She said she was going to marry him. Who said Satan is Elsa Drake? The commissioner smiled. Evidently not a criminal, or you wouldn't forget. Her father was a bank president, a good and dear friend of mine, who, since his wife's death, gave more time to his business and less to Elsa. She got to running around nightclubs. She was seventeen then, so the law was with us. You pushed around the hoodlum she admired and dragged her out of the place. Her reaction was peculiar, Satan. She transferred her affections to you. Came to see me about working with you against crime. Told her father she was going to marry you. Wrote you some letters. Then went away to school. Satan leaned back and laughed. Sure, sure, he said, I remember a painted child of wealth. I think I told her exactly what I thought of her and cured her. You told her, but evidently you didn't cure her, the commissioner said grimly. I'll drag her out of this for you, Satan said, if that's all that is worrying you and her father. Nice old duck, her father, full of high-sounding words and a little flowery when he made a speech of appreciation on my saving his daughter. He smiled. Also a hint that he wouldn't be the least bit sore about it if I didn't see her again. Offered me money, too. Can't he handle her now? He's dead. Two years nearly. Her uncle Leslie Drake is her guardian. She comes into a great deal of money shortly. You can't bully her around, Satan. She's too old, and she winds her uncle around her finger. We've got to get Paro before he gets her. Like that. This Paro takes a grip on the eight million people in the city of New York, and you do nothing. Then he puts a finger on one single girl, and you holler to high heavens. Satan opened his mouth as if to laugh, but no laugh came. He closed it again, came to his feet. Commissioner, he said, you are quite a friend. I don't know what I can do, but I'll worry hell out of Paro. Just before Satan opened the door, the commissioner said, Don't you want to know what she said to me when I spoke to her? She said, If I can't run with the hounds, why, I'll run with the hares. Love of adventure, huh? Once excitement. I'll try to furnish her with plenty of both. 
Paro has hard work clearing up his past. He had a lot of women friends, Satan shook his head. When they became troublesome, he sends them to South America, and they never return. He's got one now who will take trouble getting rid of. She helped build his career. She won't stand for another girl. He turned back and gripped the commissioner's arm. This Mrs. Tremont, she won't talk? So that was the girl who called you up? The commissioner's voice grew excited. That may be it, Satan. Perro's girlfriend can't talk. It was then that the telephone rang. The commissioner picked up the phone. He didn't say anything for a long time. Then he said simply, all right, and put the phone back in its cradle. It was a full moment before he spoke to Satan. Then he asked, was her name, Perro's girlfriend name, Betty Barber? Yes, said Satan. So, Mrs. Tremont talked? I don't think so, said the commissioner solemnly. And then he added in a very tired voice, We won't get anything from Betty, Satan. She won't talk. She can't talk. And after a pause, the medical examiner said her tongue was cut out before she died. And after a moment's pause, they're looking for Razor Jenkins. He threatened to get out her tongue, I'm told. Part 2. The Gunmaster the club elite did not cater to the ordinary run of cafe society. Tony Paro was making it live up to its name. It provided only the best entertainment and never leaned toward the vulgar. Paro liked to look on it like Sherry's or Delmonico's of bygone days. There were drunks, of course, but they leaned heavily toward the middle-aged or elderly side. Young bloods didn't turn the place into a brawl, even on Saturday nights. Society people of another era already beginning to venture out again for dinner or supper at the club elite. Their ears were not offended by boisterous talk, nor their eyes by shameful misbehavior. The prices bumped even the hardiest, but at that power was losing money on the place. Upstairs things were slightly different. One drank a bit more, one laughed a bit more, and one talked a bit louder, but just a bit. These gambling rooms above, Paro fancy, were run on the style of the former famous Bradleys at Palm Beach, the entrance was directly beyond the bar and up a flight of stairs where an attendant welcomed you or rejected you through a steel barred little square and a heavy door. Paro was in his office, back of these rooms, when Lieutenant Harrison of the police, natty and smart, in a dark blue suit, breezed in. Thought I'd drop in and see you, Mr. Paro, he said. Wanted to thank you for the donations to the Widows and Orphans Fund. Besides, I felt kind of lucky. Thought maybe I'd take a one shot at the wheel. Peril liked Lieutenant Harrison. He was a man who was going places. He was a man who knew his way around. He had a nice way, too, of offhandedly dropping police department gossip that helped Peril a lot, and he was a man who knew the value of information. But he never broke the bounds of propriety by suggesting anything so low as a bribe. "'What's new?' Peril asked indifferently, dipping his hand into a box of chocolates. "'Nothing. Detective Satan Hall.' has been acting up a bit after his shooting at Mike the Greeks. I don't think he likes you, Mr. Perro. Then with a laugh, which wouldn't bother a man like you much, he might pay you a visit, some excuse about gambling. Maybe he'd like to make trouble. Well, as he backed toward the door, I feel sort of lucky. What do you think? How lucky do you feel? Perro's eyes were friendly enough. Nice blue that set off the wavy brown hair of his face. He was a big man and handsome and he carried himself well. He didn't drink, seldom smoke, but almost continuously ate chocolate creams from a specially constructed humidor. A small candy manufacturer in Detroit made them exclusively for Perro. Always vanilla and always $2.50 a pound. Harrison said, Oh, I thought I might win three or four hundred dollars. Five hundred, said Perro with a smile. That's what I'd go out to win if I were you. He pressed a button on his desk, and a tall, slim, stooped man all dressed in black, appeared at the door. Lieutenant Harrison feels lucky, Parson, Perro said to him. As Harrison turned toward the door, Perro raised five fingers in the air. Parson nodded but did not speak. Ten minutes later, Parson came back into the room. Lieutenant Harrison went whistling down the stairs, out the iron window door, swung right instead of passing the bar, and still whistling, stepped through the little door that led into the alley. He turned toward the street. Lieutenant Harrison was a wise guy who recognized the fact that a too honest cop simply remained a too honest cop. Not that he had ever done anything exactly dishonest. There had been a few little things like tipping off Paro, but then the big boys in the city took care of Paro too. 
if he wanted to make a bet occasionally, didn't he have the same right as the ordinary citizen? If he won, well, some guys were lucky. About Satan Hall. Word had sort of slipped out to Harrison that Satan Hall had learned that the commissioner wouldn't cry over any trouble he caused Paro. If Paro had suggested it, Harrison would have stayed around and handled Satan for him if Satan went stalking through the club making trouble. Sure, Lieutenant Harrison knew of men, even on the force, who feared Satan Hall. But then that must have been because he was the commissioner's pet. Harrison would like to see that guy who would intimidate him by making faces. He had never met up with Satan and probably never would. He had seen him, of course, and Harrison turned out of the alley and bumped into a man. Harrison was a little surprised at that bump. He was a big man, and when he collided with anyone, it was generally the other fellow who gave ground. Now he was not only rocked back on his heels, but sent staggering along the sidewalk, almost into the arms of a uniformed cop. It was the officer in harness who caused Harrison to act the way he did. Ordinarily, he was an easy-going man who left well enough alone. Not now. His dignity was hurt. He ran several steps forward and grabbed the man who had turned into the alley and swung him around. You big lug, Harrison boomed, for the benefit of the officer who was sauntering up. I have a good mind to punch you smack in the nose. The man raised his eyes and set them long and steadily on the bellowing Harrison. He didn't speak. He suddenly jerked the lieutenant toward him and like a member of the force of many years standing, actually frisked Harrison. Lieutenant Harrison was stunned. He was so quick and so unexpected. Then the officer was beside him and Harrison was free. He raised his hand to strike. The officer cried out, Oh, by God, it's Hall. Detective Satan Hall. Lieutenant Harrison didn't know then and never did know what stayed his hand. Certainly, he was not a coward, but something did stay his hand, but nothing stayed his mouth. He wished later something had. He wished it then, for the words he spoke were certainly not the words he wanted to speak, he said. Detective Hall, huh? I'm Lieutenant Harrison. You're drunk. You are relieved from duty in order to report to your nearest. Harrison stopped. Then Satan's lips had parted, and his teeth showed. He thought the man was smiling, but when he looked at those green eyes, he wasn't sure. Then Satan spoke. Harrison was startled. He had never heard so much bitterness in a man's voice before. Satan said, I hate crooks, but I hate, above anything else, a crooked cop. This is yours, I believe. Satan Hall raised his hand and slapped something into Harrison's face. Then he turned and went down the alley. The cop watched Lieutenant Harrison pick up the bits of paper which had struck him in the face. He counted them. There were ten of them, and each piece of paper was a fifty-dollar bill. Harrison came erect, shoved one of the bills into the officer's hand. Something for the missus, he said. Forget the incident. I'll tend to that lad later. No, thank you, sir. Officer Riordan refused to take the money. I'll forget the incident, sir and you'll be well advised to forget it, too. He was in an unpleasant mood, sir, and he's going in to see Mr. Perrow. And what would a punk like Satan Hall do to a big shot like Mr. Perrow? Harrison sneered. Well, said Officer Reardon, who was a realist, he could shoot him to death for one thing. What the other thing might be, Lieutenant Harrison didn't inquire. Detective Satan Hall had no trouble in dodging garbage cans and turning in the rear door of the club elite. The kitchen help used that door continuously, and certainly Perro gave the impression that he had nothing to hide. He reached the hall that led from the rear to the bar and went quickly up the stairs to the little dark landing, where the barred square identified the privilege to wish to enter the gaming room. Satan kept his felt hat on and his head slightly down when he tapped on that door. Wood slid back, and the heavy bars appeared. The attendant, a shrewd, highly paid man, could not recognize Satan. His voice was soft. We don't admit anyone to this section of the club, he said. It's reserved for private parties. I'm a new member, Satan spoke just as softly. I have a card here. If you'll take it to Mr. Powell, he will admit me, indeed. He'll be rather disturbed if he did not see me. I see, said the attendant, in a voice that was supposed to convey that he was greatly impressed. May I have the card? Certainly, Satan held a card up close to the window. Fingers raised to grasp it, reached between the bars. It might be an honored guest, of course. It might be the same old attempt to get inside. Nothing ever bothered the suave attendant, and nothing surprised him. That is, nothing until that precise moment. He did not see the hand move that clutched his fingers, 
dragging his arm its full length through those bars and forcing his face close against the upright of steel, and forcing his face against something else to something the black snub nose of a heavy automatic. He saw, also saw green evil eyes, a thin red gash that was a mouth, and he heard the voice that spoke. It said, Don't press an alarm button. Unlock the door and let me in, or I'll blow your face out of its frame. And then, quite unnecessarily, the name is Satan Hall. The attendant was not a man who was easily bluffed. At the same time, he was not a man to have his face shot apart, either. He didn't know if he believed Satan's threat, but he knew of other men who had not believed it and were dead. He wasn't panic-stricken. He was quite calm. He knew it would be nice to say, Sure, I showed Satan up for the bluff that he is, but it was nicer still to be alive. So he simply snapped free the lock, felt the unpleasant sensation of being torn apart by an opening door that he hung on, then his arm fell back through the opening of Satan Hall, was in the little vestibule beside him. I will have to report your forced entrance and your threat. The attendant had recovered now, and his voice was still soft. Sure, Satan nodded. I was kidding, of course. I wanted to see if you could be intimidated. Satan swung up the remaining steps, shook his head at the pretty little page girl who wanted his hat, and was in the main foyer of the gambling rooms. Eddie Fowler, the manager, spotted Satan almost at once and was in front of Satan, as he started toward the private office of Tony Perro. Satan Hall did not find the door locked. Indeed, he almost bumped into the creeping, black-clad Parson as he swung down the final few feet. Parson wasn't quite sure what happened. He knew that he had been thrust aside. He knew that the door he was closing had been jerked violently open and as violently closed, and a tall man with broad shoulders had disappeared inside. He also heard the key turn in the lock. Perro looked up from the telephone. If anything showed in his face was simply a slight start, Paro said into the phone. Yes, you're right. He's a fast worker. He's here now. Thank you. Then he dropped the phone, put a chocolate carefully into his mouth, and looked up at Satan. It was Harrison, wasn't it? Satan asked. But he didn't wait for an answer, and he knew he couldn't get it. I told him to tell you it was coming. It was some time before Paro spoke again. Satan waited. He was going to let Paro worry about his sudden appearance and the locking of the door. The two men studied each other. There was character in Paro's face, strong character, but then Satan knew that character was both good and bad. The mild blue eyes were searching, but not visibly hostile, though apparently annoyed. The lips were thick and sensuous, and Paro held them closely together. The upper one drawn tightly down. It was hardly noticeable any more, but Paro was still conscious of the fact that his upper lip protruded, puckered slightly. Then there was a third person in that room, Satan knew, but he didn't turn his head, and it was quite possible from his position that he might not have seen that person. It was Perro who finally spoke. You are Detective Hall, of course. I presume that you have something of great importance? Skip it, Satan said suddenly. Your girlfriend, Betty Barber, was murdered tonight. My girlfriend? Perro straightened his chair. What a vulgar way of expressing it. How would you put it? You went around with her, didn't you? You tired of her, didn't you? She talked, didn't she? Well, her tongue was cut out before she died. But she rang me up at Mike the Greeks, the other. Stop! Paro was jarred out of his boasted calm. There's a lady present. Satan turned slightly and looked at Elsa Drake. She had changed a great deal since he had last seen her, but he knew her. She was just as pretty, maybe beautiful now in a sophisticated sort of way. She was dressed entirely in black, Bare shoulders, no adornment of any kind but a single small white flower in her hair. Her smile seemed very pleasant. She said it in a low voice. Satan Hall, you don't remember me, but I remember you. No one forgets such a, such, should I say, such a compelling face? Satan said, I remember you. You are Elsa Drake. I got you out of a particularly nasty situation with your another gangster a few years back. Para was on his feet now. His upper lip protruded. The year swept back. For a moment he wondered if he could reach into the open drawer of his desk, grip the gun that was there, and shoot Satan dead before he turned from the girl. He wondered, too, what the girl would say in court if it ever reached court. But he didn't reach into the desk. Satan said, There's a key in the door that the young woman can turn and walk out. If you prefer, we'll talk alone. For the first time in his life, Paro knew real fear. For a moment, he felt the beads of perspiration coming out on his forehead. He had almost waved 
a hand for Elsa to go than he remembered all he had heard about the man, Satan Hall. He wondered what would happen in that room with the two of them alone. It would be his word only if he killed Satan. And that was where the beads grew on his forehead. It would be Satan's word only if Satan killed him. That would be murder, and Satan never went to murder. Or did he? And that was a point in question that the great Paro didn't want to prove, or at least disprove at that time. He said in his voice, through controlled and quite natural, sounded husky and uncertain to him. No, Miss Drake and I are engaged to be married. There's nothing I would not wish her to hear. And feeling on thicker ice now, he said, we might dispense with the details. The same honest old Tony, Elsa Drake, crossed to the desk and ran a hand through that wavy brown hair. I'll go downstairs and have a sandwich. I'm starved. And when she reached the door and spun the key in the lock, I'll see you before you leave, Mr. Satan Hall, and you can renew an unpleasant acquaintance. She was gone, and Paro had not spoken. He had half raised his hand, but the gesture was never completed. He sat down at the desk and let his hand creep close to the open drawer. Satan was leaning over now, both hands on the desk. A half minute, a few seconds only to draw and shoot, and Satan's hands both on the desk. Yes, he was sorely tempted, as many a killer had been before him. Then a voice behind Satan, a warning voice, said simply, Don't do it, boss, don't do it. The blood rushed back into Paro's face as he saw Parson standing there behind Satan. He had slipped in the door and closed it softly, and he saw, to the expression of Parson's face, the lowering of his eyes and the movement of his right hand in his jacket pocket. He saw Satan's green eyes steadily on him, but he saw with more satisfaction those hands with the long, strong fingers spread flat on the desk, empty. Satan didn't even turn when Parson spoke. Paro was his old self now. His lips grew firm, he said to Satan. Do you know how long it would take me to get you dismissed from the forest? Just as long as it would take me to lift this telephone line. Satan said easily. There's a little matter of news interest about the dead girl calling me on the phone and warning me there would be an attempt on my life. Relief appeared on Paro's face. Satan wondered, was it possible that Paro didn't know who made the call? Was it possible that the call had not been the immediate cause of Betty Barber's death. Why are you here? Paro asked. Simply to ask you where you were last night. Many others are going to ask you. You're going to answer them. An alibi might help you. With me, now. It's not your business. It's not your line. You're here for personal reasons. And what personal reason? To, well, to do everything possible to break up my contemplated marriage with Miss Drake. Satan's laugh was a grating hollow sound, he said. I'd break up your marriage with any decent girl if I could. But I'm not here because of that girl. I'm here because of another girl. Another girl? Paro's eyes opened wide. But there was no disbelief in them. Somehow Satan's voice was full of sincerity, his eyes too. Yes, Betty Barber. I won't say that she saved my life, but she may have. That was what I started to tell you. She called me at the Greeks the night, the night three men died. I owe her something. I owe myself something. I'm going to get the man who killed her. I'm going to get the man who ordered her killed. Don't you get the point, Paro? It's common gossip along the avenue. You tossed her out, but she swore vengeance. She swore she'd talk. She talked to me, and she died. Paro smiled. I am clear that point up for you, Satan. I swear I never knew that Betty called you. You knew, says Satan slowly. That I have tried to interest the authorities in you for a long time. You knew, too, that my efforts were bearing fruit and raising his voice slightly. I know what you're thinking, Pero. You are thinking how easy it will be to hire men to do the job you are afraid to do yourself. Well, you have one more chance, and one chance only. See that the man you hired doesn't fail, for if he does, I'll come blasting into this office again, and that time I will be on the kill. That, said Tony Pero easily, will be murder. If you can get any satisfaction out of that thought, why, call it murder. And straightening from the desk, I'll be leaving now, Tony Perro. If that man behind me has his hands on a gun when I pass him, I'll shoot him to death. Satan spun suddenly on his heel, and Parson's hand jerked from his pocket empty. A moment later, the door closed, and Tony Perro faced Parson, he said. Louis Spatz lied about Betty. He said he was with her all that evening and she never went near a phone.
Carson nodded. She was a nice armful, Mr. Parle. I guess Louis got to like her pretty much. Tony Parle got up and paced the room. He dipped his hands into the candy bowl, finally said, Do you know, Parson, I could bear up if I never saw Louis Spatz again. Right, said Parson, as he reached for the phone. There was not a great deal of interest next day when Louis Spatz's body was picked out of the East River. Part 3. I like to make trouble. Elsa Drake leaned out of the darkness at the end of the stairs and gripped Satan's arm. You're not even surprised, she told him. I thought you'd pull a gun or blackjack me or something. I saw you, Satan said simply, and I knew you'd be here. How marvelous is our detective. Not only sees in the dark, but reads minds, and my mind above all others. And why am I here? There was light banter in her voice. To try to justify yourself, to hear yourself talk, to make yourself believe that you are doing the right noble thing, to tell me that you have refused to stay in the rut that society cut out for you, which inheritance and environment demanded, that you are above the petty things of life, that here's a man who has fought his way up alone, the world against him, and... Her laugh stopped him then. It seemed so natural and pleasant. How flattering, she said. It is almost word for word what I told you when I was a child, isn't it? And you remember it. I said that I loved you, too. That I'd never marry any other man. You spurned me. Satan looked at her for a moment, then started by her toward the rear. Wait, she said. I reserved a little booth back beyond the bar. It's cozy and quiet and has a little shaded light. Just a place for us, Satan, while you point out the error of my ways. I'm not interested in you at all. But the commissioner is. He threatened me with you, I think, or maybe I suggested it. For friendship's sake, for the commissioner's sake, aren't you going to tell me what a big bad man Tony is? The commissioner is very fond of both of us, you know. Are you afraid to tell me about Tony? Afraid I'll tell him? Afraid of what he may do about it? Or haven't you anything to tell? Are you going to marry Tony Perro? Do you mean are we engaged? Isn't that the same thing? No, she shook her head. We are not engaged. I know he told you that upstairs. That's what I like about him. He's so possessive. Yet there are times when he... When I think he's a little afraid of me. He kills what he fears, Satan said abruptly and brutally. Elsa Drake shivered visibly. How thrilling, she said. Do tell me about it. Satan followed her to a little table three booths down from the end of the bar. After all, he might learn something. Again, he might leave the girl with an impression that might make her hesitate about marrying Tony Perro. He noticed the thick vase and the yellow flowers it held upon the table. He noticed, too, that the other little booths didn't have flowers. The girl said, You see my little arrangements? We can put our heads close to the flowers and talk. No one can overhear us then. She straightened the vase slightly, and some leaves on the side fell off. Even in the semi-darkness, Satan could not help seeing the network on the side of the vase. He leaned over and tried to lift it from the table, but it gave very little. Satan smiled grimly and jerked the vase free. A wire snapped beneath it, broke. Satan tossed the vase and the flowers into the empty booth across from them. He didn't say anything when the girl quickly laid her purse down on the exposed wiring where the vase had been. A dictograph, Satan screwed up his mouth, but when the waiter came running, he said simply, I don't like flowers. See what the young lady wants. I'll take a bottle of Coke and open it at the table. It's all right about the flowers, Johnson, the girl said to the waiter. We were fooling. I'll have a martini, a double one. But Mr. Parro said, the waiter started and dropped as Elsa Drake interrupted him. We won't bother with what Mr. Parro said tonight, Johnson. We won't be overheard now, Satan said pointedly when the waiter had left, but he didn't directly mention the wired vase. The girl ignored it, too. She said, Tell me about Betty Barber, the details. Tony didn't want me to hear. He's always taking such care of me. He's so considerate. She was tortured to death, said Satan, nicked with razor blades, face and upper part of the body. Her tongue was cut off before she died, so she couldn't talk and... What's the matter, Miss Drake? The girl had turned a sudden white. A finger moved up to her throat as if to pull down something tight that wasn't there. After a moment, she said, Or maybe because she wouldn't talk? What made you think of that? I... I there, there was a Razor Jenkins, you know. He threatened to kill her. He was very fond of Betty Barber once, and she was close to Tony later. Jenkins might have wanted to know things. 
He, the waiter, came back then, as she leaned and grabbed the martini from the tray and drank it down at once. Another one, Johnson, she said. Don't stand there staring at me. Bring another one. The waiter hesitated, opened his mouth, and said nothing. Then he walked away. Also, Drake asked, Razor Jenkins has been arrested, hasn't he? Don't you know? No, she said. No. How should I know? I guess the details are a little gruesome. Can't we talk about something else? Well, said Satan, Razor Jenkins has been pulled in by this time, I guess. He's always was a big mouth. It was common gossip that he and Betty Barber, that he'd cut her tongue out if she talked about him. John Smith knew it. John Brown knew it. Joe Duo knew it. And after a long pause, he said, Tony Parrow knew it. So that's it, she said. You're trying to lay the crime on Tony Parrow because you're out to get Tony Parrow. The commissioner wants him because of me. The commissioner didn't know the girl was dead when he spoke to me about you. Tony Parrow, Miss Drake, is a very smooth and a very dangerous killer. I've traced back his life, and he was once tried for murder. He was 21 then, and he was acquitted. I think he was guilty. Since then, well... Satan leaned forward. Haven't you ever heard him express the wish not to see such a person again? And haven't you thought it quite a coincidence that that person died after that? No man could hire another for such a brutal, beastly murder, she said, after the second drink had been brought. No, even if a man could, I don't think he let himself out on the limb that far. It's a murder that a man would have to commit himself. Do you think Tony Parrow would hack a woman to death himself? It wouldn't be true to character. No, said Satan again. With all I know about the man, it wouldn't be true to his character. There, you see, Elsa Brake said triumphantly. But, said Satan, if Razor Jenkins didn't commit the murder, the one who did was not committing it in his own character, but in the character of Razor Jenkins. He would be playing a part and would have to play it true to character, true to Razor Jenkins' threat to cut Betty Barber's tongue out. You tell me this knowing I'm so close to Tony? You think I won't tell him? Satan shrugged his shoulders. What does your uncle think of this contemplated marriage? He asked abruptly. What would your father have thought? Father would not have liked it. He was of the old school. My uncle Leslie doesn't approve or disapprove of the things I do. He is a banker and simply the guardian of my money. But he approves of Mr. Peril personally. He invites him to our house, to his club. He is an esteemed depositor at my uncle's bank. Your uncle, says Satan coldly, is not the man your father was. He holds a very small position at the bank, makes an insignificant salary, lives well, and visits the rooms above the clubs. No doubt, and Satan went on, watching her closely, he is a man who plays only when he feels lucky. The girl waited some time before she replied. Then she said, My uncle owes Tony nothing. Satan looked at her slowly. Let us hope, Miss Drake, that we roast Peril for murder before that marriage takes place. He has an alibi, she said, before, after, and at the time of the murder, he was with my uncle. The uncle of the luck in the gaming room, Leslie Drake? The girl reddened slightly. Yes, she said. I suppose you would have the same sneer in your voice if I told you that I was present, too? Really, said Satan, it grows very interesting, doesn't it? But you didn't tell me you were there. And without raising his eyes from her, he said, Here comes Paro. I'm surprised he didn't interrupt our little talk sooner. He doesn't tell me what to do, said Elsa. But Paro did tell her what to do. Told her brusquely, too. Give me that cocktail, Elsa, he said. Now. He gripped her wrist. She held onto the glass tightly and looked up at him, surprised more than anger in her eyes. Take your hands off my wrist, Tony, she said. It hurts. It's meant to, he said, his voice very low. Give me that cocktail. You are the lady, said Satan. She said, take your hand off her wrist. It hurts her. And when Paro just glared at him, if you don't, I will remove it in a way that will positively amaze you. Paro dropped the wrist as if it had been a hot coal. His action was almost involuntary. So was his action to grab it again. But he controlled it in time. He turned without a word and left the table. Elsa Drake said, you had better go now. Or rather, I will. She came to her feet and slid gracefully from the booth. You are a very foolish man, Mr. Satan Hall. And just before she left, she turned back again and whispered softly, and a very courageous one. Then she was gone. Satan sat in silence a few minutes, sipping the remains of his coke. Then he smiled. 
She was a clever girl, and he thought a dangerous one. The commissioner mightn't do better than let her marry Peril. Part 4. Satan Takes Over Razor Jenkins didn't take his beating too long, and Satan had little trouble in getting in to see him indeed. There was a great rejoicing among the boys. The stenographer was even then typing out the full statement of Jenkins' confession. Satan asked a swarthy sergeant, So, you got another confession? Won't you ever learn? The big sergeant beamed on him. You've gotten confessions that way yourself, Satan, real ones. This time it will stick, but we've got enough on Jenkins without it. But it makes for good newspaper reading, keeps the DA happy, and leaves the grand jury nothing to do but turn in an indictment. After that, the fun begins. What's fun? Razor has no friends. He's got money, then. He's got a right smart lawyer, Sam Renwick. Satan whistled. Renwick was big money. Not the best criminal lawyer in the city, perhaps, but one who'd go further than any other with perjured witnesses, fixed jurors, and all the trimmings. He was a man who was used to having money freely in a case. So somewhere behind the show was big cash. He turned now and saw Renwick with Captain Sheridan. Sheridan was saying, Cut and dried, Mr. Renwick. Confession signed, and no one laid a hand on him. How droll, said Renwick. How very quaint. Poor Jenkins, such mastery by the police. I've always said we had the greatest police force in the world. Don't tell me you promised to give Jenkins back his lollipop and poking the captain in the stomach and chuckling at his own joke. Well, do I see him, or do I have to tell the newspapers how you kept me from him, and significantly, for a little while? Give me a break, Sergeant, Satan said. Hold off the legal talent for fifteen minutes. Ten, even Renwick will probably offer Captain Sheridan a ten-cent cigar with a hundred-dollar bill for a wrapper. If he hands me any such cigar, the sergeant said with a grin, you won't have your ten minutes, but shoot through and I'll see what I can do. Razor Jenkins was sitting at the end of his iron bed when Satan was let into his cell. There was a little blood on Jenkins' lips, but otherwise he wasn't marked. He was a skinny little man with shifty, mud-colored eyes, sparse hair, and he held a cigarette between yellow-stained fingers. He looked up at Satan and said, Hell, you! Aren't they satisfied with the confession? What else do they want? We haven't much time, Satan sat down close to Jenkins on the iron bunk. You know, I don't work along with homicide. I work alone. They are going to fry you, Jenkins. It's a frame. A frame? Jenkins' shifty eyes became steady. The cops, you mean? No. Cops don't frame guys, Jenkins. They do the best they can with the evidence they have, and they have plenty. Someone else is framing you. I don't believe you did it. I want to help you. You help a guy? A crook? That's a laugh. I want to get the man who killed the razor. I think I know who he is. He put the finger on you. Paro? said Jenkins. Paro. I thought on that, said Jenkins. I thought on that the minute I saw her body. But he's too big. Besides, he don't do his own killing any more. And if he did, not like that. A bullet through her head, or if that was too noisy, a pillow over her head, or a knife across her throat. I often, often thought on it. Satan finished the sentence for him. Don't look so startled. Often talked about it, too. They'd bring that up in court. They put guys in the stand who'd heard you. I got a lawyer. One who's tops. He'll fix me up. He said so. When did you see him? See him? Razor Jenkins hesitated, then says brightly. I didn't see him. I gave him a buzz on the phone. I knew they'd be looking for me. Where did you get the money for Renwick? Don't lie, Razor. You've been broke a long time. Now listen. He called you, didn't he? He knew where you were hiding out. How did he know where? Because someone told him. Who? Someone who must have followed you from Betty Barber's apartment. You must have known something like that had happened when Renwick called you. He told you to wait there, didn't he? Told you he'd come and get you and turn you in and protect you? You got in a panic and left. The cops picked you up and this lawyer's looking for you now? What friends have you got? Who'd lay five grand, maybe ten, on the line to get Renwick? Just one man. The man who framed you, Pero. Nuts, said Razor. He framed me all right, but why try to protect me now? Why sick a high-priced, high-powered mouthpiece on me? It don't make sense. It does make sense, said Satan. If something went wrong at the killing, that you discovered something or saw something that Pero doesn't want you to beef about, 
and seeing the surprise in Jenkins' eyes, he went on. So, Renwick called you, and you told him just what had happened at Betty Barber's apartment. And he said, don't talk, don't talk at all until I see you. And above all, don't mention something, something in particular, right? He told me not to talk. Jenkins' eyes were very wide now. Satan gripped his arm. Something went wrong, Jenkins, or Power wouldn't have sent Renwick to you. And who else would? What friends have you got? Jenkins, you're going to cook. There's only one person besides the murderer in the city who believes you didn't do it. That's me. Tell me the things you aren't to mention. I give you my word never to use it against you. Look, Jenkins, it's your last chance. I won't be able to see you again. Renwick will see to that. Now's your last opportunity. You'll think of it again. You'll wish you had told me. You'll think of it when they strap you in the chair and the smell of burning flesh, your own flesh, is in your nostrils. There, there, Jenkins began to shake. There was another person there, outside the door. He's right, Satan. Renwick is right. We keep that person out of it. I mention in the newspapers and she'll... The person will disappear. This way, maybe the person won't know I saw... Saw... Her, said Satan. Yes, yes, and Renwick will trace her and put private dicks on her and he'll find out the play and bing just like that I'm out and free did you recognize the girl no said Razor Jenkins I never saw her before she was like she come out of the apartment and he tossed a cigarette on the floor and stamped on it not a word to run with Satan not a word you swore you wouldn't no said Satan and not a word from you and suddenly as he heard a gate clank far down and heavy feet beat along the cold steel floor. He jerked a newspaper from his pocket and held the picture of the girl close to Jenkins' face. Was that the girl, he asked. Was that? It was a long time before Jenkins spoke, and then shadows broken by black bars made pictures on the wall. Yes, no, I don't know, said Jenkins. Satan had pushed the newspaper back into his pocket and had come to his feet when the guard let Renwick into the cell. Well, well, boomed Renwick, smiling at Satan. So you got a confession of the crime, too. Wasn't one enough? I know he confessed to you, Satan. Otherwise, you would have shot him dead. None of the slow, lingering torture for you. You are a man of action. No hard feelings, Detective Hall. But this will be your last visit. After all, my client is not on public display, you know. Satan went back to the commissioner's office and said, You want me to go after Peril, Commissioner, to break up this marriage? That's certain, isn't it? You can't very well shoot Peril to death, and you can't very well arrest him for murder. No, said Satan, but I can arrest the girl. That's right, Commissioner. Also, Drake. For murder? The Commissioner was amazed. She was in the room with the dead Betty Barber. Certainly she can be held as an accomplice before or after the fact. It's not a pretty prospect for a young girl. A highly strong young girl whom I... Yes, yes, Satan cut in. Whom you dandled on your knee as a child. Well, a dead girl on the floor with her tongue cut out is not pretty either. I thought I'd tell you before I got the warrant. Satan, said the commissioner slowly. You don't believe she committed such a crime? If she didn't, Satan said, you could say a lot of words that would probably straighten the crime out. I'm going to put the squeeze on her. She talks, or I drag her in. The commissioner got up and paced the room. He had handled men for a long time. He had even handled Satan Hall, which no one else in the department, great or small, ever claimed to have done. Finally, he turned and faced Satan. Satan, he said, I am not going to stand in the way of you and what you feel is justice. This young girl is in trouble. Her father was my best friend. I'm not saying she is doing anything to enhance an honored name. She's doing plenty to hurt it. I hope to prevent her from hurting it and herself more. You know, of course, that to place her at the scene of the crime will smear her for life. Satan smacked his lips. The sound was not a pleasant one. That, he said, was the chance she took when she went there. Well, said the commissioner, I think you are wrong. But you do what you think is right. I brought you into this thing because I thought you were the only man in the department who could handle it alone, without outside help. If you can't get that help, of course. Satan grinned. I could handle it alone, he said. If not, another cop in the city raised a hand to help me. If not, and seeing the commissioner smile, he said, Okay, Commissioner, maybe you are the smarter one between the both of us. He walked to the door, put a hand on the knob, and pulled it open. I won't get any warrant, but I'll tear the case wide open. And if the cards fall that way, 
I'll blast it into the open if it lifts the roof right off the city hall. You won't interfere? The commissioner opened his mouth twice to speak, but it was a third time before the words came out. Then he said simply, I won't interfere. Satan didn't believe that Elsa Drake had committed that murder. He felt that something or someone had sent her to the scene of the crime. He took a trip to the medical examiner and established the time of death of Betty Barber at between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. Old Doc Newberry wouldn't put it officially closer than that. He said to Satan, Death didn't take place before 9 and certainly not after 11 o'clock. I understand the case is closed, Razor. Jenkins gets the chair. Takes the rap, you mean, Satan said. Doc Newberry straightened. Like that, huh? You don't believe he did it? It's a rather ordinary murder, Satan. And after a moment's hesitation, for Dr. Newberry rather liked Satan, they say you'd like to pin it on a certain man, a big man. Suppose he is too big to roast. No man is too big to die. Satan wheeled then and strode out of the doctor's house, and the doctor went back to his beer and cheese on rye. It was then close to nine o'clock in the evening, and Satan, ignoring a cab, hopped to a subway up to 72nd Street, walked up Broadway a few blocks, and turned towards Central Park West. The stone steps of the brownstone front that echoed dully under his feet was the well-worn entrance of the Drake residence. Mr. Leslie Drake felt that he was of some importance in the bank, and in a way he was. His brother had been president, and Leslie had grown great in his shadow. Now, Though somewhat diminished, he was thriving on his niece's shadow, at least, that part of the shadow cast by the money her father had left and of which Leslie was trustee. He dressed the part of the man he thought he was in the way he thought such a man should be dressed. His clothes were always somber, his face was always somber, and the black ribbon that ran from his pince nez down into his waistcoat was just a bit thicker than even he thought his importance called for. When the doorbell rang, he got up quickly from his chair and placed the detective thriller behind some books in the shelf, straightened his tie, and took a squint at himself in the mirror. Even his niece had never seen him in what he liked to call his light leisure moments. He didn't have to replace the detective book for another, or one was already lying on the table before him, carefully turned over to be picked up at any moment. The book before him was called The Human Side of Banking. It meant nothing to him. But a friend at the club has said that it meant a great deal to the customers, providing they read no further than the cover. The hour was late for him, almost five minutes of ten. He wondered if it was his niece, Elsa, coming back from a forgotten key, as it never entered his head that she would be returning at such an early hour for her. He went to the door and pulled it open and was somewhat surprised at the man who pushed his way in, and relieving him of the door, pushed it closed with, well, not exactly a bang, certainly, with considerable unnecessary force. Hall, said his visitor, Detective Hall, of the police. Leslie Drake did not lose his dignity, though it was slightly ruffled. He said, Isn't the hour rather late? It's about the same time that a girl was murdered. Murderers and cops don't work regular hours. Is that the library? I want to ask you a few questions. I don't think we shall talk at all. And when Satan blocked, the hand that would have majestically thrown the front door open for his dismissal, Mr. Drake continued, Do you know, Detective Hall, just how long it would take me to have you removed from the force? Just as long as it would take you to lift the phone, Satan said. I've heard that one before. I'm here in serious business, Mr. Drake, and you'll have to be on your own. And when the dignity still remain, all right. You'll have it, then. Things have happened that connect you up rather closely with the death of Betty Barber. If the man was acting, he certainly was a great actor, Satan thought. The look on his face was one of utter amazement. He turned, seemed to feel his way towards the open door of the library, though there was plenty of light in the hall. He was inside and sitting in his chair, not fully recovered, when Satan, following him, spoke again. Standing before the great broad desk, Satan said, Maybe I tossed it at you a little hard, but no matter how I put it, it's not going to be an easy dose to swallow. If you feel that you wish to have your attorney present or someone from the bank, all right. But what I say is going to involve the honor of your family. And as the banker seemed to brighten a bit, he had yourself as well as your niece. Now listen. You made a statement to the DA over the phone, but an inspector of police got a signed statement. I have read it. Was it all true? To the best of my knowledge and belief, your niece Elsa never left you between the hours of 8 o'clock and midnight. You're playing gin rummy, isn't that it? You and Elsa and Paro? And Elsa never left? I couldn't say she never left a room. I didn't say that. 
They were like refreshments, I believe, and she was in and out. But never more than ten minutes. You are sure of that? You signed a statement to that effect. Fifteen, perhaps? She? You signed ten. And leaning forward, as a matter of fact, wasn't she gone for hours? Was she here at all? And when Drake would have come in indignantly, All right, Mr. Drake, here it is. I place Elsa Drake directly at the scene of the murder, and I can produce people who saw her. Now, do you want to change that statement? Was your niece here at all that evening? Was Paro here? Good gracious. Tony Paro was the one who said we must say she was with us. He... But what am I saying? Wait. Yes. I will see an attorney. I will say nothing more. Surely you can't believe. You can see your attorney downtown, Satan cut in abruptly. I know your rights and I know you know them. I have a warrant for your arrest here in my pocket. Get your hat and coat. Satan heard the step and saw the figure as he heard all steps and saw all figures before the girl spoke, she said. You have been very noble, uncle. You won't have to explain. And turning to Satan, Paro is out in the hall. He'd like to talk with you. If you want me then, well, you can have me, if you are said I'm making a mess out of it. Someone made a mess out of the barber woman, Satan said calmly. I'll talk to Paro. Satan was always willing to listen to anyone who wanted to talk. So many men had talked themselves to death. He couldn't put things quite together yet. But somehow he did feel that there was an attempt all around to protect the girl. Then when he saw Paro, he didn't move. His mind was working like clockwork now. Paro assured him smile was not so assured. A quick blast hit Satan's mind. Was Paro with the banker when the girl was murdered? Couldn't Paro have plotted the whole thing? Arranged to have the girl go too? And Paro spoke. I'm not armed, Satan, he said, spreading his dinner jacket open. My top coat is on the chair. You can frisk me if you wish. He was surprised that Lieutenant Harrison had been with the suddenness and thoroughness and quickness of that search. No, said Satan, you're not armed. What do you want to say? First off, that I know the truth. Why you want to get me? You loved Elsa once. You love her still. And not liking the look on Satan's face, he went on hurriedly. I don't blame you for that. Who told you that? The low interest, on my part. Her uncle? No, Satan, no. And he now is one help you. Elsa told me herself. Satan cut in. That's not the talk I want to hear. And looking hard into Paro's eyes. So you know why I'm here? Yes, Paro nodded. Razor Jenkins told you he saw Elsa and Betty's apartment. That won't stand up in court. Perhaps he may even deny it. Satan's lips parted and his teeth showed. Though his eyes remained hard, Power imagined that he smiled. It won't matter, Satan said. I have prints made of the girl's picture. Someone will have seen her. More than one with an honest record. It was fairly early. When you have your subjects, it's not too hard to find witnesses. You know that. Satan whirled, but it was only Elsa Drake coming down the stairs. She carried no bag. Her dress was sheer. Her hands were empty. Well, Tony, will he come up in the sewing room and talk, or is he afraid? He searched me, said Peril. Anyway, he wouldn't be afraid. No, said Satan. I wouldn't be afraid. Not if you had two guns on you, Peril. But I'm afraid you have nothing worth listening to. Well, you have to tell him the truth, the girl said in a low voice. Yes, Paro nodded very glimly. I guess I'll have to tell him the truth. Satan Hall, come upstairs. I'll tell you who murdered Betty Barber. Then you can call the commissioner and see if he likes the way you broke the case. And it wasn't Razor Jenkins? asked Satan. No, said Paro. It wasn't Razor Jenkins. I guess you've guessed it, Satan. You're smart. I knew Jenkins didn't do it, so I hired him a good lawyer. So he wouldn't say he saw Elsa Drake there? Yes, Paro's grin was not pleasant. That was a part of it, of course. Even the lawyer doesn't know where the money comes from. But he has his instructions. Uncle will hear if we talk here, Elsa cautioned from the bottom of the steps. All right, said Satan. I'll listen. It better be good. And I make no promise of it being off the record. We can't hide it now, Paro's arms came apart. And then frowning, he said, You are a big man, Satan, and you dislike me. Will you leave your firearm below? Satan didn't even smile. He simply shook his head. He said, It's a big house. Men have been known to hide in the dark and shoot from the dark. I never shot a man to death who wanted to say what I wanted to hear. Part 5. Scene Set for Murder Paro and the girl preceded Satan up the stairs. Green eyes behind them peered into the darkness ahead of them. One white hand of Satan slipped 
along the banister, the other hung empty at his side. Did he feel that Power would not attempt to have him killed there in that house? No, he wasn't even sure of that. It would be a desperate move, even if Paro felt any hope of carrying it off, and would only be attempted at all if Paro himself had been guilty of the killing of Betty Barber, not only guilty of the brutal murder, but pretty sure of having the crime pinned on him. What would hit Paro the hardest? The breaking of his alibi, of course, and already Satan had broken one link in it. Certainly the girl was not with Paro when the murder took place. Somehow, Satan felt that Paro was guilty. He didn't expect to believe the story was going to be told, but he wanted to listen to Paro. Would Paro be like a lot of criminals before him, talk himself smack into the electric chair? They were in the sewing room now, and Satan had closed the door behind him and spun the key in the lock. At least the girl had called it a sewing room. But she was talking now as Satan, with his eyes never off the pair, opened the one closet and looked in. The girl was saying, It used to be a sewing room. I sort of fixed it up as a study. And what do you think I'm studying, Satan? What do you think all those books along the wall are about? Crime, remember? I told you once I wanted to work for the police. Work with you, wasn't it? And you laughed at me. But now, look at that collection. She waved her hand around the room. It seemed unconsciously to hover for a moment over Perro, Satan said. Yes, quite a collection. He had covered the room with his keen eyes, the couch against the wall, no room to hide under it or behind it, shades drawn at the window, curtain pulled back and not reaching to the floor, not any place big enough to hide even a cat. He looked at the open two-pound box of candy on the table, saw that the top layer was pretty well gone, and said, "'Shall we sit here at the table? You there, across from me, Perro. You at the end, close to me, Miss Drake.' The girl reached over and lifted the candy box, offered one to Perro. Satan watched him pour over the candy and finally select one, saying, "'Chocolate creams. Vanilla. My only real dissipation. Last one, I'm afraid.' The girl offered the box to Satan. He shook his head. "'Afraid of poison?' she asked. "'I am not,' said Satan very slowly. "'Afraid of anything.' I'm not afraid of guns in other man's hands, yet I don't look down the muscles to see if they are loaded. The girl said nothing. She took a piece of candy and laid it on the table. Her hands remained in her lap. Paro's hands were plainly on the table. Satan placed his hands on the table, looked at the girl. Her smile was not very pleasant, but she put her hands on the table. Paro said, I am not going to try to make a deal with you, Satan. I am not even going to ask you promise that you will not divulge where your information came from, though I know the lowest criminal is entitled to that consideration. To begin with, a certain man fell deeply, or at least passionately, in love with Betty Barber. I am human. I loved, I do love, Elsa very much. I encourage this other attachment. This man, do you want the details first, or the name of the murderer, and then the details? The name of the murderer, now, and the proof. The proof should be quite easy. I'm afraid he won't deny it. All right, it's going to make a smell, but it won't put the name of Miss Drake so far above mine. She'll be marrying a man who has tried to live down the past. I will be marrying a girl who's, well, her uncle killed Betty Barber. Satan was surprised. If he could be shocked, he was shocked. Green, suspicious slits of eyes open wide. Leslie Drake killed her? Like that? Just like that, Paro nodded. He knew his niece was there. He saw her, I think. He called me in to alibi her, and incidentally, himself. Yes, I got it out of him. They can't hang me for that. After all, he was the uncle of the girl I love and intend to marry. And you weren't with Leslie Drake that night at all? No, said Paro. Not at all. I won't have any trouble proving where I was that night. But I was experiencing a devil of a job proving that I was with Leslie Drake. What made him do it? A murder like that? Harrow shrugged his shoulders. He says it was a blind rage of jealousy. You ask him. When I repudiate his alibi, why, he'll talk. But Razor Jenkins and Miss Drake here. There was a blank look on the girl's face as she lifted the candy box and, taking a piece, put it into her mouth. I don't know, she said in a faraway voice. I don't know about Jenkins. I suppose it was like me. Betty Barber called me to come. At least it was a woman who said she was Betty Barber. She said not to tell a soul. She said it was something that affected my entire future. With Tony here. She looked toward Paro. It wasn't suspicion and distrust. Tony, it was... I thought maybe I could help you. Here, she held the box of candy toward him, and when Paro shook his head, 
the bottom row under the paper creams there look she lifted up the paper satan knew and he didn't know he knew that the girl suddenly dropped the box upon the table jerked back and toward him and threw out her arms crying in a high-pitched voice no no uncle leslie he couldn't have then her body had spun and she was behind satan and both those waving arms were clasped tightly about his body pinning his arms to his side Satan knew then, he saw the gun in Perro's hand, knew that it came from the candy box. He saw the gleam in Perro's eyes, recognized it as the lust to kill, and then his right arm had shot out, knocking the girl across the room, and his left hand had gone under his right arm and came out again before Perro pressed the trigger. It was death, yes. Satan knew that, but he knew something else, and his lips set in grim satisfaction. It would be death for Perro, too. His finger was closing on the trigger now, and his head instinctively ducked to one side, when the yellow-blue flame belched from Perro's gun, almost blinding him. Those hardly six feet between them and Perro's fingers had closed on the trigger, a good chance before Satan had fired. Powder burned Satan's face, but he knew that Perro had missed, and then the slug from his gun pounded into Perro's chest. It lifted him out of his chair and sent him crashing backward to the floor. Perro moved a bit upon his shoulders. Then lay still. Satan came slowly erect and looked at the girl who was getting to her feet. "'It's too bad I had to kill them,' Satan said evenly and without viciousness in his voice. "'You've made a good pair, a couple of rats.' When the time came to shoot, he turned yellow and missed, missed at that distance, and walked across the room. He looked down at Perro, kicked the gun out of his twitching fingers, and said, "'It wasn't her fault, Perro. She did her part. You can take that thought to hell with you.' When your moment came, you failed, but it wouldn't have made any difference to you. We'd have died together, that's all. I'm going to die? Perro gasped. What do you think? There was a noise in Satan's throat that might have been a laugh. There's a hole in your chest big enough to drive a truck through. Perro said, I know. Well, will you do for her, the girl, if I talk? Satan shrugged his shoulders. You'll be dead. I'll pin the murder on you, or if I don't. I always know, and you'll be dead anyway. So you sent for Jenkins. You sent for the girl, Elsa Drake. You told her uncle you'd help them alibi her, and so alibi yourself. She, she, I thought she was going cold on me. I'd risk anything for her. I had a dame telephone Elsa and say she was Betty Barber. Then she'd tell her things about me. Then I did Betty in, that way, so it would look as if Jenkins did it. I, I didn't know Jenkins would see Elsa. I had Jenkins trailed. If you didn't know Jenkins would see her, why did you send her over there? I loved her, Perro gasped. I wanted to have something on her so she'd marry me. I told her uncle, I told Elsa, that she was seen in the murdered girl's apartment. I could have told her that even if Jenkins hadn't seen her and so, so, so force her into marriage if she hesitated? Satan bobbed his head up and down. So that's the way love works. But then I wouldn't know. You threatened her too, I guess. So she'd hide that gun in the candy box for you? To kill me? Shoot the knowledge about her out of my head? And looking down at the dying man as he thought of the torn body of the barber woman, he said, You'll never know, Paro, if Elsa Drake planted that revolver there because she loved you or because she feared for her own self. You, Satan straightened, there would be no more words coming. He could accept what Paro said as a confession. Tony Parra was dead, far too dead to talk. Satan swung on the girl and said, When did you know Parra killed her? And when Elsa Drake stared at him all the time. No, no, Elsa Drake shook her head. I suspected when he grew jittery about Razor Jenkins telling you I was there. But I knew, yes, I knew when he asked me to plant the gun for him. To kill me? To try and kill you, she corrected him. He didn't know. I know, Satan told her, but you planted the gun and held my arms at my side. He's dead now, Elsa Drake came close to Satan and placed two small white hands with delicate fingers upon his shoulders. I never loved him, Satan. I haven't changed any from seventeen to twenty, not that way. You laughed at me then. That was a mistake. Satan took both her hands from his shoulders, held them very tightly at her side. Yes, that was a mistake, he echoed her words. I'm not laughing at you now. Her eyes looked directly into his. She said, What do you intend to do about me? It was 
a good name, Drake, Satan said thoughtfully. The commissioner said so. Your father was a fine man. The commissioner said that too. Your uncle is, well, maybe a good man, but a fool for people like you. I hate criminals, all of them, men and women. Thin lips grew even thinner, hard eyes grew even harder. What am I going to do with you? The commissioner dandled you on his knee. He is my only friend in life. I am going to do something I never thought I was even capable of doing. So, you never put that gun in the candy box. You never lifted the box for Paro to grab it. You never held my arms. In fact, you were never in this room when the shots were fired. Paro drew and he missed and I killed him. You rushed in and heard his confession. We may need that for the record. And as a loud knocking pounded on the door and the hysterical voice of Leslie Drake called out, Satan continued, We won't have to place you at the scene of the crime at all. Razor Jenkins won't talk, for I'll have him sprung under that condition. You might even, the girl said eagerly, say, I really assisted you in gathering evidence? And smiling at the utter disgust in his face, she finished off. Because of your esteem for the commissioner. Get out, was all Satan said. He walked to the door and unlocking it, threw it open. The white face of Leslie Drake stood out. He was talking, but no coherent words came. Paro is dead, said Satan, thrusting the girl into the hall. She ran in after I shot him. What's his hollering about the police? Should I call them? You are a detective, I know. Word suddenly came pouring through Leslie Drake's dry lips. Wait in the hall, said Satan. And closing the door, he went back to look the room over again. What a wild story Paro had concocted, he thought. No one would believe it after a little thought. A Paro's gun had come before the thought. The fear in Paro's face before he shot. But no. Satan remembered now that there was no fear in Paro's eyes. It was hard and cold and cruel in his eyes. Yes, so sure. Satan ran his hand across his chin, his eyes still burned from the powder. His hand came away from his face, dark and smudged. Powder, he said, a half aloud, gunpowder. Yet the bullet had missed him and hit the wall. About here, he turned and faced the wall. And about here proved to be a picture that still hung on the wall. He looked for the bullet hole, couldn't find it. Looked for the slug that might be upon the floor, but there was no slug. Then he crossed the room quickly, knelt down by the dead body, lifted up the gun. He looked at the barrel. He broke the gun open, blanks. The heavy thirty-eight the peril used had been fully loaded, but there wasn't, hadn't been a live shell in it. Satan sat down by the table. For the first time in his life, he actually admitted surprise. The girl had left her uncle's study below and quite evidently had come up to the sewing room by the rear stairs. She had planted the gun in the candy box as planned by Paro. Clever, too, for Paro was always eating chocolates. But what hadn't been planned by Paro was a substitution of the live shells for blanks. That explained the lack of fear in Paro's face when he fired. And Satan thought that might explain, too, why he was still alive and Paro was dead. But having the blanks handy showed more than just the will to save Satan's life. It showed premeditation. At least it showed forethought. Satan put his chin in his hands and thought deeply. There at the club elite, how clumsy Elsa had been in knocking away the greens that disclosed the microphone. Or how clumsy he had thought she was. He got up after a while and shook the cobwebs from his head. Then he jarred erect. Fool, he thought. Why hadn't he guessed it when he first knew that Betty Barber wasn't killed because she telephoned him at Mike the Greek? And the answer was so simple. Paro didn't know Betty telephoned him at the Greeks because? Well, because it wasn't Betty Barber who telephoned him. He recognized the voice now, or thought he did. It was Elsa Drake. All along she had been playing a part, a dangerous part, a desperate part, and she had been playing it for him. He opened a door and strode out into the hall started down the stairs. He met Leslie Drake at the bottom, Satan said. I must call the commissioner. There's a phone there in my study, and Satan walked toward the door. My niece is in there now. Satan hesitated, half turned, started to ask if there was another phone, then didn't. He had never shirked his duty before. He wouldn't shirk it now. He walked straight toward the door, flung it open. The girl stood in the center of the room. Satan closed the door slowly. She looked at him a long time, searching for the truth in his face. Then she came forward and put both her arms around his neck. Yes, Satan, she said, as if answering an unspoken question. I was the one who telephoned you at Mike's, too. She kissed him then. She was slightly surprised and a little pleased when he didn't knock her down.